Welcome to Reflections, a program where we discuss values and virtues for the transformation of the individual and the society at large. I am Father George Ehusani. And today in the studio, I have with me Dr. Chichi Aniagolu Okoye. Chichi, you are welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having me, Father. Dr. Chichi Aniagolu Okoye is the Africa Director of South Saharan Development Organization. South Saharan Development Organization. They are into the development and affirmation of women and girls. And youth. And youth, women and youths. Um, since you were in girl effect, I thought that it is continuing girl. But you have, you have, this time you are generous enough to involve boys also. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, before uh, her appointment as Africa Director of the Sub-Saharan Development Organization, she was the Nigeria Director of Girl Effect, an organization that is focused on the uh, development and affirmation of girls and the imp letting the world know the importance of training girls and raising girls in the proper way. And before then, she was also the country director of Oxfam, Oxfam, uh, the development uh, agency. Um, I always like to say that, uh, uh, let the world know that uh, Chichi is the daughter of the renowned Supreme Court Judge Justice Anthony Aniagolo of blessed memory. I mean, I got to know him and i'm so happy that i got to know your dad and when i see you i'm reminded of your dad and i know that everything you have achieved now part of it is what your dad and mom put into you once again welcome to the studio thank you so much today we want to discuss nigerian youth the welfare of nigerian youth and children what are the challenges what are the opportunities okay right now you are country direct you are africa director of uh, the Sub-Saharan, South, South Saharan uh, Development Organization, and you are focused on women and youth. Um, what are the challenges with our youth? With the level of violence in the society, with the level of destitution, poverty, unemployment, to what extent are these affecting our young people and the prospects of our young people in a very competitive world? To what extent is it are these challenges affecting um, the morale of our youth, um, the uh, ethos of our youth, the values of our youth? What are the challenges? And also, what are the opportunities? Because I am aware that um, uh, in today's world, there are a lot of opportunities for young people. Uh, IT, for example, uh, we say that um, the older people like us are immigrants in the IT world. Young people are the natives of um, uh, indigenous or natives of the IT world. So what are the challenges and what are the prospects um, uh, and opportunities for young people in today's world? Okay, thank you very much Father. I think for me the major challenge of uh, young people in Nigeria and maybe Africa in, in general is education. I mean I'm just going to put it down to education because it is it is that lack of foundation that is causing everything else. Um, we have an educational system that does not provide opportunities or does not prepare young people in Nigeria for the present or the future. And so um, we find that a lot of the opportunities that are available to young people that they are not taking advantage of it. So for instance, we, um, we have a situation in which we have a burgeoning um, population. And we have a high rate of unemployment, which is actually a contradiction. Because the more people there are, the more needs that the people have. Which and means so that it's supposed to, to produ produce, produce more exactly. and then people buy more. And exactly. Um, so so in, that, in that kind of contradiction, you can see why the educational system is to blame. That young people are not able to, to see the, you know, um, to take advantage of this population growth that we have. So all the sectors are suffering. We don't have enough food, you know, um, and yet we don't have enough young people going into agriculture. We don't have enough um, people even in the education sector, health. Every sector is, you know, is, is looking for innovation, is looking for dynamism, and the young people are just not prepared to have it and would um, um, and even going beyond innovation just the regular mundane father you run an agency i run an organization 
trying to hire people in Nigeria has become such a major issue. You know, um, first of all, a lot of young people don't, really don't want to work. They're really looking for where to come in and, um, and just sit around doing nothing. They have no skills. You know, um, they, they are not honest. And so you find that even when I, I tell a lot of young people when I go for seminars that a major problem of young people is lack of honesty, lack of trust, because trust is the biggest asset that you can have. If people can trust you, they'll be willing to invest in you. But most times we think that being, you know, um, looking for the shortcut, the, you know, lying, you know, um, Pretending that we have the skills that we don't have. So you have people, you, they have this fantastic CV. You know, oh, I do IT. I can do this. I can do that. You, you, you tell the person to turn on the computer. They don't even know where the computer, you know, where to turn on the computer. And I'll say to them, how did you think you were going to get away with this? Somebody is looking for an IT expert. You claim you're an IT expert. Did you think that they wouldn't test you? On the, I mean, how did you think you were going to get this mm. job? These are the effects of the exam malpractice that we have been the having. Exam mal the exam malpractice, the poor educational system, the lack of values. Because I said to them, you know, in, in secondary school, they used to tell you that, you know, if you wanted to get a loan, that um, trust was a major asset. Mm -hmm. And we'd, we'd, nobody really took it for granted, uh, took it um, seriously. But if you look at today's world, in a place where, in, in a situation where being able to get, you know, credit for a business you want to start is so difficult, and you're going to rely on friends and family, nobody's willing to lend. Because nobody wants to pay. Pay back what they've been lent. They will lie about getting the money. They will lie about what they want to use it for. They would not even have the courtesy to return to the person to say, you know, uh, I'm sorry, this yeah, is what I'm, has I'm happened. I'm not able to meet my exactly. obligations. So these little things, it's not really the big things that are the problem. The little things, you know, the little things that we were taught as kids growing up, you know, say what you mean and mean what you say. A lot of that is gone. So in the, inform in, in the formal sector, you know, we had the lack of education and the rest of it, but that could have been complemented if we had honest, hard-working people who were ready to start and do businesses and who could be supported by their families. I, I, I tell the story all the time. If you look at Asia, a lot of the reason why um, Asian products are all over the West is because those who migrated and went abroad were able to see opportunities and send back money to the family to start cottage businesses mm -hmm. and send those things to them and those things have grown. Everybody, 90% of those who did the same in Nigeria lost their money. Their relatives made away with the money. Oh, 90% of the people who sent money home. To start up a business, to start up, you know, to even have houses built for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All the, all the, 90% lost their money. And so you have people in the diaspora who have excess, you know, who have excess money. But are not willing to send it home. Are not willing to send it home anymore. They just send the little hundred dollars or two hundred dollars to take care of their mothers and their relatives. And that's it. And yet, if we had had the trust, so many cottage industries would have been able, would have mm. been started that could have been sent abroad. So for me, it's education and it is, you know, the lack of trust. So you are, of moral it, 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 values. It, it, it's still part of education. Exactly. So you are talking of comprehensive education. We're yes. not just talking of academic. Yes. Um, actually, you know that uh, up till today, when you get a university certificate, it says that this person has been found worthy in character and learning. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is shortfall in character. Yes. Uh, uh, we have a major f shortfall in learning, but even perhaps more shortfall in character. Yes. And, and I'm like, so those statements in certificates, whether it is diploma or graduate certificate, those statements are becoming empty or what? Completely. Um, I think for me, there is an educational crisis in Nigeria that we are not paying attention to. It is a time bomb. And, um, and, and unfortunately, the educational system or those in charge of education are more interested in inserting, you know, um, Islamic education or Christian education. People are worried about things that are not, are not really what the issue should be about. We're in a situation where young people do not have the skills 80% of people who are graduating from universities in Nigeria do not have, know how to use a computer. 
How in the how in world? In the 21st century. How are you going to be able, even the nobody nobody uses secretaries anymore. No. You know you have every, to type every, your own work. Everybody has to work, you know? do his work. And then even when you say to young people, oh, do you do you know how to use a computer? No, okay, go and learn how to do it. They don't, because they're all looking for work in the ministry or. Uh, national defense where they'll stand on the main road and be collecting money from people or some sort of you know m you know mind numbing jobs that we are creating in Nigeria you know you you have senators who are giving um graduates KKK to go and dry and I'm thinking this is what you think that you know six seven years of education that the country invested in people to have university degrees to go and do you think and the reason and you as a senator representing them think that what they need is to create more traffic on the road you can't even sit down and 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 formulate something you know that is worthwhile you can't train them in computers you can't train them on how to develop apps you can't train them on 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 things that they can actually have the skills forever i mean they, call, they call it mass transit can you imagine they call Keken to pick three people. They call it mass transit. It's um, it's 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 unbelievable. And and like I keep saying, the lack of shame, the lack of shame, that we have leaders who are not ashamed of the way things are. They go to other countries. They see every day you go, something new has been developed. You know, every day you go, people are creating new, you know, cre recreating their world. And you come back and you feel no shame? The problem, as you are narrating, is uh, enormous. So you are talking of a time bomb when it comes to education. Because I would like to take it as education, comprehensive education, mm -hmm. so that we're not even isolating the moral and uh, ethical issues from the academic issues. So we're talking of a major collapse in the educational sector, whereby we produce graduates of engineering, and we're not able to produce a pin. We produce graduates of, you know, all kinds of um, career areas. And they end up driving kekena pep. Mm -hmm. and, and you're like, hey, is this, as you said, is this what all this investment, primary, secondary school and university, do you need more than a primary school uh, education to drive a kekena pep? or even to drive a bus for that matter. And you are con quite concerned and you have this South Saharan um, uh, Development uh, Organization. What can we do about it at this stage? Uh, we are still having a situation. When we are seeing the results, the mm -hmm. negative results, but we still have in our towns and villages a lot of miracle centers whereby um, young people are not studying for WASC, they are looking for centers where they can pay invigilators and pass. We are already seeing the results of that. But somehow, um, it's like the information is not going down to the grassroots to say, look at the result of a dysfunctional educational system. Look at the results of uh, miracle centers um, uh, cheating at exams. How do we help the society to know that if we go the direction we are going, will only end up in more destruction than we already have. They say, if you do not change your course, you will end up where you are headed. How do we help everyone in the society to know that where we are headed is not going to take us home? I think for me, I really like to start from the individual level. Um, because, you know, when something affects you individually, that's what you can relate to. That's what you can, you are emotionally, you know, um, vested in yourself. And what I try to do with young people is to say to them, when you cheat at exams, you are not doing that exam for somebody else. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it for yourself. You need to understand that when you don't know what you are meant to know, ultimately an exam is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Yes. What you want is an education that arms you with the, you know, with the knowledge and the tools to be able to create a life for yourself. So when you cheat at exams, you're not doing it for me. Yes, society will ultimately suffer, but you will first of all suffer. Sure. Because you see people who tell you, oh, I've been out of school for seven years, I couldn't get a job. Put them through an interview, they don't know anything. And in that seven years, they haven't done anything, anything. To, improve, to improve themselves.
And that's because they didn't bother to they go didn't through have, the... They didn't have the background. Exactly. The foundation. Except the foundation, you know. Um, and so that for me is a starting point. The individual needs to understand that they are mortgaging their own lives. I think that in terms of society, I think that the people who rule us have seen, have ample examples of what a poorly educated people, you know, the kind of society that comes out of a poorly educated people. Look at the, you know, the violence in the society. Look at even the ritual killings. I saw a video the other day that completely traumatized me. A woman's head that had been chopped off and left. And people will be putting, you know, loading those things on... Uh, you know, and then you say to yourself, why will somebody think that chopping off somebody's head and turning it into a powder, whatever they do with the rituals, is going to translate into money? I mean, does that even make logical sense? And when you look at the people who are actually doing the rituals, they are as wretched as ever so you have this wretched man who has the power <laughs> to, 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 turn, to make you a millionaire, to make you a millionaire but, but he is not, not a millionaire not himself himself. even if you say okay the oracle say he should be poor what about his children what about his relatives you know what about what about all the people who are around him so both the the, the, the so, so you and, and the people who go to these people are not illiterate technically so you say to yourself society is is slowly coming to an end the violence it's one thing. But also for me, the major thing also is the hopelessness. Because what society is meant to give its people is hope. Which is why the church and the mosque is so important. If you don't give people hope it's, it's, and reinforce that hope, there is nothing else that they are here for. Yeah. And society, the Nigerian society has completely failed in terms of giving young people hope. And so... From that premise, I'll say, well, it's, it's, it's not all doomsday. Okay. Because, first of all, the society, Nigeria exists, and Nigeria actually has resources. I mean, if we're talking about small countries like the Gambia and the rest of you might think, oh, my God, how do you, what do you do? But here, I remember the old video, the, the old jingle that says, scratch ground small, yes. you know, and um, you get resources. In Nigeria, there is hardly anything that you touch. That is not potential, you know, wealth. Exactly. I remember when we lived in Lagos, the back of the house, we threw away uh, watermelon seed. And it grows. We didn't, without planting it, the whole back was covered in watermelon. So the thing is, it is, it is first of all, to open the young people's minds to the opportunities that are available. In every, there is no village in Nigeria, I'm not even talking about local government or state. There is no village that cannot be economically viable yeah. in this country. The thing is to open the minds of young people and to reorient them into saying, you know, everybody getting a job in, a, in an office is great. But first of all, you need to have the skills for it. But beyond that, being your boss, your own boss is what everybody is actually looking for. Most people go to self-employment and then um, to um, paid employment, then to self-employment. If you're able to actually start a business on your own, yes. that's actually the most rewarding thing that you can do. So the thing is to open the minds of young people to the opportunities that are available and let government and other organizations, civil society organizations, the church and the rest of it, really begin the character building that is required to make that business grow. Because it takes a lot of discipline to run a business. You know, government just keeps giving people oh, loans, which is great, and I'm glad that they are doing that. But giving people money isn't going to turn, isn't going to teach them how to wake up 7 o'clock in the morning, you know, um, make sure that they... Um, that they have customer relations. I had a friend of mine who is from the, who's British and who I met with him two days ago. He was wearing a suit that was really nice. He told me this suit was actually sewn by a Nigerian. But he says, of course, you know, he's never on time. You know, you have to quarrel with him for weeks and weeks before your clothes come. Sometimes the buttons are not in the right place. So you can't even export things like that. But this is a person who has talent. Yeah. And after some time, but this, he has talents, but he has no discipline. He has no discipline. He has no character to his business. And very soon, people like this man, who actually is purchasing from Nigeria because he has, he wants to because, exactly. Know. He will get to a stage where he's tired, and he says, "Listen, you know, I can actually walk into any store and buy a suit." And so he might be patient because he has, um, an, um, a, well, I say, he has a an, uh, a um, a bigger reason why he's mm -hmm. doing it. Mm -hmm. A lot of Nigerians wouldn't even bother. You don't give me my clothes for two days. You don't see me anymore. Yeah. You know, so people are actually losing business because 
they don't have the discipline and they don't have the character. So the character for me is extremely important in really being able to build the businesses. And that's why we are constantly having businesses failing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're constantly having people not able to carry, you know, to, um, to maintain and grow their businesses. How, how do you get, you have talked about the individual, but the individual will only achieve what you are talking about, discipline and character and diligence uh, in studies and so on, if the individual has been taught. We seem to be in a situation where, as the Bible calls, says it, my people die for lack of knowledge. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The young person in the secondary school who is looking for miracle center to, to pass her egg, has not been properly taught, has not been properly motivated, has seen a society where cheating does pay. Now, so we are losing him. Mm -hmm. Now, it appears that this kind of education has to begin from the cradle, from home, from the parents. Now, are we not beginning to have a set of parents who themselves do not have it? Nemo, that quad non have it. You cannot give what you don't have. Aren't we beginning to be now to have to witness a situation where even parents do not have the values? Because talking about exam malpractice and medical centers, it is parents in large measure who actually organize to pay invigilators to make sure that their children are assisted to cheat at exams. Now, when you have that kind of situation, how do we address it? Well, we're going to reap what we sow. In the African setting, people have children so that their children can take care of them in their old age. Today, you see children who are in their 30s who are, and, still, and living, see babies. Who are still living at home, who have no jobs, who, have no, you know, who are not able to do that. I know people who have not even gone back to see their parents in 10 years because they don't have you know, the resources to be able to support them. So... As parents do this, they need to understand that there is a consequence for every action. You support your child to cheat at exams, but you hope that the child will have a job to take care of you in your old age. It is foolishness in its, in, in its perfection. And so I think, again, that the parents need to understand, and we need to begin to tell parents, it's not about the child. It's not about the result. It's about the knowledge that this child needs to be able to you know, take themselves to the next level and to be able to support you in your old age. So if you need to burn the midnight candle to support the child, if you need to um, get um, extra lessons for that child, you know, anything you need to do is better than helping that child cheat at the exams. In South Saharan, we have, we have put classes on the radio. You know, we have a, with support from the uh, MacArthur Foundation, we have um, a radio program, you know, called Radio School, where we have put curriculum-based classes on the radio. It's airing in Enugu and Nadamawa State to help kids. And we're hoping that we can get more resources to make it a nationwide thing. When you, and it is first-class teachers who are putting, you know, uh, who are the mm -hmm. ones who are running these lessons. So all the kid needs to do is to turn on the radio, you know, and, and really begin to learn. And we're seeing a lot of changes in the two states in which we have done Because this. in any case, there are things you can't do for the kids. There are things they must do for themselves. Exactly. So you have put all the lessons on radio, but the child must put on the radio. Exactly. And make time to sit down. Uh, um, uh, whether the parents or the teachers, there are things you cannot do for anybody. Every ch growing up child has to learn to um, leverage on the opportunities and uh, grow from learning indeed and but but of course the child needs to know that they need to learn and that's the work of the parents and that's the work of those of us you know who have a concern because as a kid if i hadn't been taken to school and if i hadn't if i didn't have parents who had insisted that i had to do my homework and I had to do that, i probably wouldn't be sitting here with you today so there is a lot of work to be done at the foundational level to actually get that child to understand that it is important for them to learn. And that's a challenge for parents. On that note, we'll bring this segment to an end. Chichi, we'll need to have you for a second segment uh, to continue this discussion. Children have to be made to know that they need to learn. Now, who has to do that job? 
parents first and foremost and teachers uh, we pray that our parents a new generation of parents will emerge that we recognize that as you said what you so, sow you reap you sow um, cheating you reap you know children that cannot take care of you in old age um, we pray that our a new generation of parents will emerge a new generation of teachers will emerge that recognize that the way we are going will not take us home on that note we will end this segment Chichi thank you for coming thank you so much father thank you thank you why isn't it possible for a husband or a wife to say I am sorry please thank you these are basic acts of courtesy and yet it's lacking are we grooming more men and women who lack just the basic rules of courtesy one survey found nigerians the most religious people in the world then the next survey the corruption index found nigeria i think the second most corrupt it's country it's in the world that same year and then another survey found nigerians the happiest people on earth and so we seem to be a society of contradictions i know for example at my age there are some words till today I cannot say, but you find three, five, seven year old children just peeling it on the street and it doesn't matter. And in fact, it is seen as a level of sophistication. A big man was threatening handcuffed and hair was let loose. And I asked some of my colleagues, are you aware that on a daily basis, the ordinary people who have committed minor malicious offenses, and not only uncuff their leg chain, yes. but nobody talks about them. And thrown into Black Maria. Thrown into Black Maria. Sometimes the Black Maria is put in the sun. The tragedy of the military coup is set in motion a range of issues that so destabilized this country. And the result is that we've ended in the last 20 or 30 years with an academic community that has become so traumatized that it has also lost the capacity mm -hmm. to even do what intellectuals and academicians ought to do. I have the pleasure of having in the studio once again Dr. Chichi Aniagolu Okoye. Chichi, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Father. Good. Dr. Chichi Aniagolu Okoye is the Africa Director of South Saharan Development Organization. Africa Director, your um, office is in Nigeria, right? Yes. Good. I mean, there's no other place you should be to direct. Uh, South Saharan, yeah. Uh, she's the Africa director, and then they are into development and affirmation of women and youth. Uh, women and youth. Before uh, she became just this year uh, the Africa director of South Saharan Development Organization, she was the Nigeria director of the Girl Effect. The Girl Effect, where they focused on girls and issues of girls and affirmation of girls and support of girls. Before then, she was Nigeria director of Oxfam. Um, it's wonderful to have you again in our studio. And this time to discuss the welfare of youth and children in this country. What are the responsibilities of government and government policies? Are we ever going to have a vibrant, productive, functional youth population? What are the responsibilities? Of government are there major governance issues in talking about the welfare of youth and the challenges that face us in that area are there major governance issues if there are what do we have in place in terms of governance on the local level local government level state government level federal level what do we have in place and what could we have in place to ensure a future generation of people that can compete with the rest of the world before I even talking about competing with the rest of the world a future generation of men and women who can run their society well feed themselves well uh, take care of their their affairs well and then we talk about competing with the rest of the world what are the government governance issues I think for me the the, the first thing is policy um, and, and when I talk about policy, I'm actually not talking about making policy. I'm talking about implementing policy. Do we have the, the right policies? I think, that, I think that within, I mean, there are policies that do not exist. Um, for instance, we do not have um, um, policies around 
innovation you know uh, we don't have a policy of, of changing curriculum quickly yes you know um to be able to adapt to changes mm -hmm. in society mm -hmm. i mean recently of course i mean the government expanded um the curriculum in in schools and um there's a lot of vocational and technical training uh, education that has been added incorporated, to it, okay. incorporated but no teachers of course um, for many of those subjects and in many of those states so that's where we go to implementation it is important to fine-tune the policy and we have to continue to you know um, um, create policy especially at the state and especially at the state level because states are really the ones who are responsible for uh, primary and uh, to a large extent secondary education the federal government is apart from the federal schools the federal government schools that there's really nothing else that they're doing at the federal at the primary and secondary levels so the state governments are really the ones who can change you know um the face of of um, primary and secondary education and and, and and i will agree with you that at the state they don't have a lot of policies when i was at girl effect um one of the things that we tried to do was to support the Kano state government to develop a girls education policy mm -hmm. Um, and this is something that, of course, that most states don't have, don't have a girls' education policy. Most states do not have, you know, even a, uh, um, um, a, a, uh, a foundation education policy. What does that mean? How do we, what kind of education do children need? Because uh, as you and I were talking about earlier, we have um, um, primary schools and preschools yes. that are bombarding little children with, with math, with, yes. English, French. geography, but all sorts of things that, that they are really, their young uh, minds are not ready for, for. The, uh, for at that time. So is there a policy that regulates things like that? Yeah, meaning, a, meaning policies to regulate what these preschool administrators, what they do with these exactly, children. Exactly, exactly. Um, because, because that's really where it starts. You know, if you don't have that correctly, it becomes very difficult um, um, for the child to be mentally ready for the, you know, for the other things that are going to come. And of course, if you know, if you look at Nigeria, um, the situation is bad all around. But if you look at northern Nigeria, the situation is even 10 worse. times worse. You know, and um, and that for me is a, is is an even bigger um, challenge. Um, uh, challenge, you know, going forward, and and I and, and I do not think that the states in the north recognise or um, how dangerous the situation is, and so if we go from policy to implementation, we need to be able to create incubation centres. You know, with government needs to be able to incre create incubation centres where you know. Um, almost like a, a, a think tank where people are looking at what are the needs of this state. And what shall be what our shall needs in the next 25, 30, 50 years. Exactly. And then what, what do we need? To, what kind of education do we need? Mm -hmm. If we have, you know, cocoa in our communities, you know, how many cocoa experts are we producing? How many farmers are we producing that are going to be able to take over from the old and aging farmers and how much technology are we supporting and implement and and um, and and, uh, and uh, how much technology are we applying in our state and what do we need because it is when you do that then you now say okay we're going to give scholarships for people who Targeted. are going to exactly for for people who want to go into cocoa farming for people who want to go into technology around cocoa because we see that the future for us here is yes, cocoa. cocoa yeah the same thing everywhere else and that's why we're not growing you know if you don't have that kind of focused educate you know for focused planning you cannot tailor your needs to what your what you are talking sector. about chichi is functional education yeah a, a policies that are targeted at functional education yeah now we have universities in this country that every university seems to be doing everything so you are in river state you are in um, Kano State, you are in Ogu State. Every university is struggling to read medicine and read law and read this and read this. And it's like, this is not the format in other parts of the world. That universities specialize. You cannot have experts in every area. And I think that perhaps one of the reasons why you have a list of the first, first 1,000 universities in the world, first 500 universities in the world, and you can hardly get a Nigeria university in it, part of the reason is that we are struggling with little resources and what we do is that every new university is doing every course and then students pass through those universities read those courses and come out and for 10 years cannot find a job because they, they are not really functional how do we 
get our people from where we are now to where we should be, where, which you are describing, functional education, so that I come from Kogi State and we have iron ore and then we are supposed to have a Jakuta Steel Complex, so that education for the higher institutions in that area are targeted at producing manpower and engineers that will harvest these resources. How, from where we are now, how do we get there? Competition. Father, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. All over the world, we see how people have taken themselves from one level to another. In Nigeria, we celebrate mediocrity. Hmm. If you do not create a competitive environment, what is it today that will make a university excel in Nigeria? What is it? What is it? What, what is a competition between the universities that one that will make University of Nigeria want to be better than University of Lagos or Lagos better than anybody? What? Nothing. They, they, like everybody else, they get their subvention at the end of the month, you know, from federal government, you know, the tax students, um, you know, um, to death to be able to collect whatever extra there is. And they just live within that. There is nobody saying, I want to become the best research institute for X or Y. And so I am going to go out there and partner with international agencies and really create a center within my university. I, is it not and then your support, and, and if you do that, there is a TEP fund that is, or, or, or some other government agency that is saying, there is a company, any university that is able to, mm -hmm. you know, set up um, X, Y, and Z or able to, bring in resources of a certain amount, we're going to double it. Mm -hmm. So it's not everybody coming to collect the, the same, same amount, amount of money. There is competition. You know, um, you get more. The more you do, the more you get. The more you do, the more you get. Once you start doing that, once we create competition in this country, you will see excellence because people are there. Everybody wants to wake up at 10 o'clock in the morning, even I myself, if I could have a chance to. But the only reason that pushes me is because I know that there is a consequence and that there is also a reward, yes. you know, for me. If there is no reward, if at the end of the day, you know, what I do, it makes no difference what I do as, a, as against what my driver does and what, you know, uh, my, um, my, my junior officers do. Why should I work so hard? They're talking about this functional education and then competition. You know, we have a situation in this country where really it's as if for especially public service jobs, one university is not different from another. No. Whereas you travel out of this country, you go to, the, you, you go to Europe, you go to America, which university you attended is very important. I mean, I, I, I was in the U.S. and I noticed that somebody who has a degree from Princeton, from Harvard, mm. from whatever, can earn 10 times his colleague that went to a community, what they call com community colleges, mm -hmm. with the same degree. So you have a degree in law from Princeton University or Cornell University. This person has a degree in law from some community college, university, and one person earns 10 times the salary of another. Reason. Reason is that as they are hiring you, they recognize that by virtue of the university you have got, for you to get that certificate from that university, they know the amount of work you would have put Indeed. in. Indeed. They know that you would have excelled very much. Mm -hmm. And so, they actually literally plead with you, come and work with us, because we know by holding the certificate, we can vouch for what you have. Now, can we do the same in this country? We definitely can. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, if you look at, the, the, like I said, um, Nigeria is not open for business. That's the way I see it. I, I just don't think that this country is ready and open for business because there is nothing that, that needs to be done to take a country to the next level that we don't know. We just don't do it. And the reason we don't do it is that we are a lot more sentimental than we are rational. You know, we, we're not yet ready because, of course, it's going to have a major impact on the power relations in the country. If you create a, a meritocracy and you create a competitive environment, many of the people who are probably uh, advantaged will lose, um, you know, will, 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 will lose their position. On this program, uh, sometime recently, we discussed this whole thing about meritocracy. Mm -hmm. Versus uh, federal character and uh, zoning and those kind of things. We said that um, federal character system is not unique to Nigeria. There are countries where you have affirmative, affirmative action, and then you try to bring people who are 
you know, not at par with mm -hmm. the others at par, but that there should be a timing. There should be a, a time limit. Say, we do this for 10 years, or we do this for 20 years. But a situation where it just continues forever, and um, you start having, like what we had recently in this country, where uh, cut off mark 120 out of 400, now accepted by, by, by JAMB. Um, that, is, that is canonizing mediocrity. Because a situation where somebody obviously failed. Now you put that person who has 120 to sit in the same class with somebody who had 280 to study the same thing. Now what have you done? You have brought down the level of interaction in the classroom. Now, so uh, what we said was that in that program that there needs to be timing, a, 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 a time lag for this, this question of affirmative action. So that you don't just keep going forever. When we started at independence, it was recognized that parts of the country are educationally, quote unquote, disadvantaged. Parts of the country are educationally advantaged. How do you, you know, bring them at par? Is it by fixing outrageous cutoff marks? You know, rather shameful cutoff marks, meaning people who obviously have failed. Or do you work on elementary education, the foundation in those places, pump resources? get experts to those parts of the country to make sure that by the time this child is getting to primary six if he has to spend 10 years before getting to primary six so that he will be at par with the person who is supposed to be from educationally advantaged area but not by reducing the pass mark to 25 or 30. you know yeah father you know um it, it just comes down to what i had been saying before exactly Affirmative action actually works where people are disadvantaged. Yes. In Nigeria, um, northern Nigeria that is being targeted with affirmative action is not disadvantaged in the sense that, you know, you don't have, it, we, don't, we, we didn't have an apartheid government that um, uh, made sure that people didn't go to school there, that, that, that suppressed people. On the contrary, we've had northern Nigeria ruling Nigeria for many, many, many years. And so if you look at it and see, okay, if it is not an issue of, um, you know, of, um, of oppression, is affirmative action the right solution? Um, and the issue is, and exactly what you said, that if you find that people are e educationally backward, you address the educational back backwardness. You don't pull down the whole country. No. You really look at what it, it is that is what are the challenges is it teachers is it whatever resources so the affirmative action should actually be that you should I, I, I put more educate more money in the educational sector and really targeting those um, um challenges at the face but father you know it goes down to the point i was making about education and shame as an africanist as a pan-africanist nothing has pained me more than this idea of that, the, that, goes. that no that the north is is um, educationally backward because for me it goes to the core of racism that black people are accepting i'm stupid yes i am stupid lower the mark for me that's basically what the so affirmative that's what you mean by lack of a sense of shame exactly how can we as africans accept that a group of 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 us in a part of nigeria are saying yes we are stupid yes we cannot learn so as a result of that lower the lower cut off the, the mark. mark so that i can pass this is something that that we as as a country really needs to say this is it is it this is unacceptable we need to be able to say no there is nothing wrong with the intellect of a, of a northerner there's nothing wrong with the learning ability of um, of a child in northern nigeria what is missing that they don't have the support that they need and as a country we should be able to say, no, as black people, we're not going to accept that there's a part of this country that says, I am stupid, I cannot learn. You are very correct. I accept what you are saying because right now, perhaps the best auto uh, vehicle designer with General Motors is from Sokoto. Yes. The Jilade guy. Yes. Yes. It's from Sokoto. I mean, the best designer, engineering designer for uh, the auto vehicle for General Motors in America. He is cool in Sokoto. I went to a federal school. I went to federal government college in Loring. And most of the people who came from the north 
when they came into our school, couldn't yes. read or write. Yes. Some of but, them just couldn't. But by the time they By finished. the time they were done, one of the girls had one of the best results in my secondary school. It is unfair what is happening in northern Nigeria. It is unfair to put a whole generation of people and tell them how yeah, I am yeah. going to help you is that I'm going to, to, to bring down, down the, you know, and you're not doing it. Like I said, at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's not about southern Nigeria. It's about the educational, you know, a mess that you're creating in your part of the world. Because those kids, you're going to reap what you sow. As long as we, we allow these kids not to have an education, not to have hope, you know, the drug abuse situation in northern Nigeria is getting really out of hand. There's a lot of frustration. And, and all because we're saying, oh, you cannot learn. Let us give you pass marks. And the problem is that we, when those things were done, the assumption was that, that government will always be the biggest employer. So even if you had 10%, you're from the north, we're going to give you a job in the ministry. Those things don't exist anymore. No. Now people have to compete. Mm -hmm. And you come to the private sector. You can hardly find northerners working in the private sector. What, what, have, what have you done? What are you doing to our people who are from the north? We need to be able to create a society in which everybody can take care of themselves. I mean, what, what, what Chichi is saying is that it is actually a shame for us to accept that our state is educationally backward exactly. and therefore lower the standard exactly. for us. Exactly. And it is, it is the loss of the sense of shame that makes Nigerians to literally to ask for it. Yeah. You know, and I say, you, you, you think that your state has certain handicap in education? Where is it? Is it in the pre-nursery or nursery school? Pump resources into it. And if you are going to be asking the federal government to assist so that you can have more resources, asking non-government organizations to come in and support so that the pre-nursery school is of high standard, primary school is of high standard, so that by the time they meet at federal government colleges, they pass the same exams yes. because you have built up. The, 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 element, the foundations and build up the secondary schools so that you don't pull down the, the pass mark for university. Let everybody that is entering university enter at a certain given level. And the thing is that the kids are able to do it. They are. I work in northern Nigeria. My work in, 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 um, in um, Girl Effect was 100% northern Nigeria. I see these kids as we start to work with them, how they blossom, how smart these kids are. What so is, they have been denied opportunities. They have been denied opportunities. And yet the rest of Nigeria is looking at it that they are being given opportunities. No. Anybody who tells you that you're not good enough it's not doing you a favor. It's not doing you a favor. Anybody who tells you that you do not have the capacity to be the best that you can is not doing you a favor. Northern Nigeria leaders or the federal government or whoever is creating these policies is not doing a favor to, um, to the citizens of Northern Nigeria. This is unfair. These are intelligent people. These are sm Once you put them in the, in the, look at the, the right the one, environment. Exactly. The ones who are in Southern Nigeria, the ones who are going to school, the ones who do go to school. I mean, is Sanusi not a, a Northern Nigerian? And all the other people who came out with first class, who went to, uh, to um, 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 Catholic universities, in the old, uh, Catholic schools in the old days, are they not northerners? Is there something in their brain that makes them different? No, they're just as smart as anybody else. But when you have a system and a government that thinks that tokenism is favor, that thinks that, that getting things easy and free is, is, is doing your people a favor, that is a travesty. I, I think this whole thing of government you know employing people people go to collect rent you know a rent economy rent seeking uh, people yeah yeah uh, so people just think that okay i am a permanent secretary i am a director or i am governor okay i have a location i have a, a slots for 100 people to be employed in my state they are not qualified they are not motivated you employ them because, as you said, people think that everything has to come from government. But in the modern society, what drives society is the private sector. And the private person who sets up an, an NGO like you or sets up a business wants the most qualified person. Exactly. So if you get uh, 120, if you enter the university with 120 and you are helped, as it were, assisted to graduate, you hold a certificate. By the time the person comes to in for interview, I mean, you can take the person. Look at the oil industry which is our, our, cash um, cow. our cash cow. Look at how many people from the north are in NMPC. 
compare that to the north, to the people from the north who are in Shell and all the other um, um, private competitive. Compa yes. Yeah. You have ninety percent in N NMPC, less than one percent in these other ones. It's a clear show that if NMPC falls tomorrow or it's privatized, if, if, if it's privatized, then many of those people will lose their jobs, and they can, and they're not employable. Even though they have had this number of years of experience working in NMPC, they're not they're not employable because they are not because it's all about rent seeking. Who are you doing a favor to? Because the future of oil and the future of every sector is a private sector. It's sure. business. Sure. How many businesses in northern Nigeria are owned by northern Nigerians? How many? Still all because of poor education. Exactly. And not poor education because the people don't have the intelligence. Poor education because those who are supposed to channel resources to that area are not channeling resources to that area. And perhaps because we have published, politicized everything. Oh, uh, you are not from our state. You cannot be uh, made a teacher. You cannot become permanent staff. So they put everybody on contract. Every non, uh, uh, quote unquote, non indigen on contract. At the end of the day, you have unqualified, ill-trained people who are teachers in our schools, who are teachers in the universities, and then this is the result we're getting. No, you're totally correct. As long as we continue this mediocrity, celebrating mediocrity, thinking that um, the way to take our, our country to the next level is giving freebies, we're not going anywhere. We have the capacity, we have the intellectual ability, we have the resources, you know, we have the people, we have the population to take this country to the next level. All that is missing in Nigeria is the leadership. And as long as we and, and as soon as we get that right and we have people who are saying, because, you know, it doesn't really matter if you say, OK, um, so what do I do? We're already in that situation. I have a state in which there are thousands of kids and I don't have good teachers. What do I do? Technology is available. Begin like to do we, something like about we, getting teachers. Like we did with the girl in, in South Saharan. We put school on the radio. So, yes, you may not be able to attract in Boronu today because of the conflict. A, a, a teacher from, um, 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 from Queen's College yes, or yes, whatever, yes. who's going to, nobody's going to want to go and work there. But you can record that teacher and send, and to send that, and that you can use video conferences, you can do all sorts of things. Technology has made it such that you don't need to be physically I, I am anywhere. Remind, I am reminded of the work of this Indian Khan. Exactly. Uh -huh. Who created the open school. Open school. Yeah. And reaching the remotest villages in India and educating people and people are getting PhDs. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, this technology is available to everyone. One of the things that modern science and technology have done is that um, nobody can now claim it. Once yes. you produce it, it's out there. Indeed. Once you discover it, it's out there. Why would... What kind of leaders do we have that deny their children of this? Deny future generations of the benefit of modern technology? And while we are still struggling with the technology discovered 20 years ago, they are moving on to new things and our children are left to drive keke na pep as you said in the previous one are left to drive keke na pep and uh, um uh, what's your last word about the responsibility of people in government the responsibility of senators and house of rep people and governors and local government chairmen and councillors because creating the infrastructure is the primary responsibility of government then the individuals are asked to bloom and flourish with this infrastructure. But the government has the responsibility of providing the infrastructure, the enabling environment. Yes, indeed. I think for me, um, first of all, government has to understand that we are in a race and that the time is running out and that they need to create that enabling environment. And that if they need to intervene, where they need to intervene, they need to do it. I recognize that, you know, um, the trend in the world is, you know, government has no business in business. But the honest truth is that if you're in a part of a country in which no business is coming, government. you had better step in, you know, and create that environment. I, I, said, I, I say all the time that if I was ever a governor, I will build factories and sell them. I won't run them. 
but build them because people are not going to want to come to your state where they have to deal with uh, local communities, get land, do all the things that need to be done before they can p build their in industry. The same thing with education. You need to be able to set the standard. You need to be able to create the type of schools that you want. Actually, when you're in remote areas that are not attractive, mm -hmm. and then you can actually lease those schools out and sell them. Government needs to be the, on the driver's seat. It is not going to happen magically. Because we are very religious people, we hope on hope. Hope is important. But <laughs> well, we need to work. But we need to work. But the hope is important because at least we are not fatalistic people. Yes. And so the good thing is that once you have hope and you put a little bit of work, you actually do much better than those who have no hope. So my advice and my final words to the government is we're sitting on a time bomb. You know, education is the most important thing that you can give a young person. Malcolm X said, you know, uh, while he was sitting in prison, that was when his, his life transformed because he got access to books. Mm -hmm. And that's where he became the leader that he became. There's so many young leaders in Africa who have no access to the books, who have no access to the education. And that's where they are. It's government's responsibility to make education a priority if they want to transform this country. On that note, we will bring this uh, second segment with uh, Chichi and Yagolo Okoye to an end with a challenge to government. Government has the responsibility of setting standards for education. And talking about setting standards, a situation, you talked about shame earlier, a situation where senior government officials cannot put their own children in government schools is truly a shame. It's truly a shame that the Minister of Education, the Commissioner for Education, the Councillor in Charge of Education, they cannot put their children in the government schools that they superintend. It is a shame. And we need to do something to ameliorate this shameful situation. Thank you very much for enlightening us on this. And I do hope that those who are watching, those who are listening, can take something from this, that we all have work to do. We need to drag the feet of those who are running our affairs to defy our democracy. We need to constantly challenge them to do what they must do if our country will rise from the present uh, shameful uh, uh, situation to uh, a better level. Uh, God bless you, and um, uh, may God, in his goodness, raise for us good leaders, mm. leaders that are accountable to the people, leaders that are committed to the common good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chichi, for coming. Thank you so again. much, Father. Thank you. Thanks.